Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Although most Christians today believe hell is a place where the damned suffer eternal conscious torment, the Bible teaches that the lost will simply perish. For example, the most famous verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16, right? Did you see the two options there? On the one hand, those who believe will have eternal life. On the other, those who do not believe will perish. Now, considering that eternal life contrasts with perishing, we shouldn't envisage perishing as also having eternal life, but of a much less pleasant variety. Does that make sense? So this is the idea of annihilationism. So the annihilationist perspective is that hell destroys or causes to perish those who enter into it. And if this perspective is true, then the question comes forward, what do you do with those handful of texts that seem to imply that the lost suffer continuous and unending torture? My guest today, once again, is the Baptist pastor Warren Prestige of Auckland, New Zealand. He will help us work through a few key texts to make sense of everything, including Matthew 25, 41, Mark 9, 47, Revelation 14, 11, and 20, 10, and then Luke 16, where we read about the rich man and Lazarus. What you'll see is how Prestige's careful reading explains what these verses really mean in their context without reading in medieval assumptions about infernos and torture chambers. In the end, we find a consistent doctrine throughout Scripture about the fate of the lost in their destruction, not torture. Here now is episode 406, Difficult Texts for Annihilationism with Warren Prestige. Our topic for today is confusing texts about the fate of the lost. Are you excited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I tell you, this is such an important topic, don't you think? It is a very important topic. It's such an issue. People get so uh, difficult to just to dialogue with over it, too, I've found. For some reason, this is a particularly emotive topic for, for, for many people. It's difficult sometimes to just sit down and look at what the Bible actually says and set aside what tradition has been telling you and maybe what you've been brought up with and so on. Yeah, yeah. This is one of those interesting areas where you do have tradition and you do have a lot of folk ideologies communicated anywhere from cartoons to Dante's Divine Comedy to some of our theological dictionaries uh, will perpetuate this kind of traditional idea that yeah. people are are tortured endlessly and uh it is it is still very popular and uh although it not at funerals you don't you don't ever hear anyone <laughs> no. confessing no. Uh, about hell at a funeral uh it seems like everyone no. gets uh launched into heaven uh at the funeral yeah. but um, yeah. Not when I do funerals. I try to stick with just the scriptures and the sleep of the dead. But uh, let, let me ask you this, uh, Warren. Thanks, thanks for joining me a third time. But uh, how would you think about the small group of texts? I mean, because there are a small group of texts here that do seem to imply eternal conscious torment. Um, how, how do you think about those in general? Well, I think it's important to say, first of all, that that they are a very small group of texts. People that advocate eternal torment don't seem to appreciate how few they are. And even most of the texts that appear to suggest it really only suggest it to people who already come to the texts with that in their heads. It's pretty clear that this idea came along with quite a few other ideas from paganism originally. And then people looked in the Bible to see if they could find corroborating uh, witness to it. But the Bible from Genesis to Revelation 
uh, seems to me to say very clearly the wages of sin is death. The final uh, outcome of the lost will be an end to life in the very literal sense. I mean, it, it begins, doesn't it, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, and, and the judgment is given there that uh, if you do that, you will die, and die is defined as returning to dust. It's also de defined as being deprived of the tree of life. And then right over in Revelation, there's the tree of life uh, in the New Jerusalem, but the alternative is described as the second death. So the Bible seems very consistent about it all through. Uh, Moses sets before Israel in Deuteronomy 30, for, 30, he sets before them life and death. Ezekiel 18 is a very careful priestly exposition of the matter, and he says the soul that sins will die. We all know Romans 6.23, the great evangelical verse, the wages of sin is death. And yet I've heard people advocating eternal torment, saying we all get eternal life. It's just a matter of how you live that life. Some we live in ecstasy and some we live in torment. Well, that's just such a blatant contradiction of what the Bible says that I cannot understand how anyone could, uh, could say such a thing. In Matthew 7, Jesus said there are two ways. Uh, the way that leads to life, the broad, uh, the, the narrow way, and then there's the broad way, and that leads to destruction. And this word destruction is used very often in both Testaments, used in the Old Testament. There are so many different Hebrew words that are used that are translated destruction, and yet they all mean a literal end. Psalm 59 uses one kalah. Well, that means to complete, to come to an end. The translation is often consume, consume them until they are no more. And the, the rest of the sentence defines what the word means, until they are no more. It's a matter of annihilation. Isaiah 41 uses a very common word which is used for destruction, avar, and it says those who strive against you, God, will be as nothing and shall perish. And so again, the, the word, the intent of the word destruction is defined there explicitly as being as nothing. People often imagine that for some reason the human soul can't be destroyed. But Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, that God is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Just as it is for the body, so for the soul. God will, however you define soul, God will, can and will destroy it just as he destroys the body. Second Peter 2 verse 12 talks about the fate of the lost being the same as the beasts, corruption. The word is often translated there, corruption, for different word, thora. There it is, it's the same as the beasts. So in other words, it, it's a literal end that we're talking about. And the Bible so often uses this imagery of fire, or if you like, the literal reality of fire. Well. You ask yourself, what does fire do? It doesn't sustain beings in torment forever. It, can, it, it destroys them. The world is facing all these fires at the present time on the west of the United States and Australia. We see fire doing its work. Well, it destroys things. It destroys people, literally. And Malachi, the last chapter of the Old Testament, tells us clearly the day of the Lord will burn up the wicked like stubble, like char. So that's we're talking here about destruction. Uh, it's awesome. It's something to be feared, but it's not unintelligible nightmare. Uh, it makes sense. It's, it's the fact that everything that is without God will ultimately cease to exist uh, because only with God can we exist. So, the, the Bible is so overwhelmingly clear and consistent about this matter that when I come to uh, a couple of texts, and there really only are only a few which uh, seem to imply something different, I don't immediately throw out the whole witness of the Bible and uh, suddenly jump to a different conclusion on the basis of those few texts particularly on such a weighty matter as the fate of the lost, you would think that the Bible would speak consistently and clearly on such a matter. And so I, I don't just throw away all the rest of the Bible. I, I come to those texts and I have another look at them.
and I see, in fact, whether that is uh, whether uh, eternal torment is really what they are implying or saying. And I have found that uh, no, they're not. Although they are perhaps going out of their way to insist on the seriousness of judgment, they are not altering the witness that it is final destruction. Well, we want to get into some of these texts in just a moment. Just off the cuff here, I, I did have a thought that a lot of Bible-believing Christians will hesitate to even consider somebody talking about hell in anything other than eternal conscious torment, because they've been taught that's the biblical, traditional understanding, and the progressive, liberal forms of Christianity that don't hold to the authority of Scripture, that these are the the forms of Christianity that embrace annihilation or universalism. And I I just wonder how, how you might respond to that claim that disbelieving in eternal torment is a liberal position to hold. Right. Um, first of all, I, I think one thing needs to be cleared up about conditional mortality. Sometimes people think that if you con- believe in conditional mortality, you deny that, that the lost will be raised for judgment. So I've struck uh, a number of cases where people have assumed that I don't believe uh, the lost will face final judgment. I just believe they go out of existence at death. And that's not what I believe at all. Uh, I believe the Bible quite clearly teaches that the the lost will be raised for judgment and will face God, and then in his judgment they will uh, um, be rejected and they will come to an end. Uh, so I think that's one thing to clear up, that sometimes people misunderstand that. I think, too, that people who hold eternal torment often fear that if, if you reduce the sentence you somehow or other reduce the effectiveness of the gospel in reaching people i mean in our penal code we have we don't have in new zealand uh, the death sentence the death penalty i know some states in america still do but we don't and the reason is we find it so horrific yeah. uh, and yet when it comes to the fate of the lost apparently the death sentence isn't good enough for them in the opinion of these people. I find that very hard to understand, yeah. that uh, that would be considered to be a light sentence. Right. On the other hand, um, people that advocate for eternal torment feel somehow or other that conditionalists are accusing them of being morally insensitive or morally inferior because they contemplate the possibility of a God who who believes in in eternal torment, or or perhaps they feel that we who hold to another view are unable to fully take God fully seriously, that we we don't fully respect the holiness of God. And so all these kinds of assumptions and feelings and uh, judgments come into play, I think, rather than simply focusing on what the Bible says. That's why I I always want to stress to people that I haven't come to this position because I was found the alternative morally repugnant. Uh, By the same token, uh, uh, universalism is, um, in in my view, not biblical either. So it's not as if I want to swing towards a universalist position. It's it's nothing to do with uh, wanting to minimize the seriousness of the gospel. But frankly... If you think that the only thing that will bring sinners to salvation is the fear of eternal torment, you're not, seems to me, doing Jesus very much honor. (laughs) There surely must be something more more valuable about uh, advocating Jesus. Jesus must be more worthwhile than that, simply as if that were the only reason one would want to put one's faith in Jesus, to avoid eternal torment. Uh, It seems to me that you do more dishonor to God and to Jesus by thinking that way than than the alternative. Well, that's that's a good answer, and I really appreciate how your focus is not on how this fits into systematic theology, not on how this makes people feel, 
not on how other people will perceive you in light of this, but on what the Bible says. And, you know, what you've really staked out here in your book and uh, also in our previous conversations is a biblical case. In the end, you're going where the evidence leads, and what you've seen is the preponderance of the biblical evidence is on the side of the lost perishing, just like it says in John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in the whole Bible, that uh, they will perish— and that then those who are who believe in the Son will have eternal life. So notwithstanding the uh, handful of texts that we're about to get into here, your intention is to be on the side of Scripture as opposed to yeah. some other reasoning behind it. This accusation that says, oh, you're just uh, diminishing this concept so that Christianity will appeal to people more, uh, That's that doesn't hold any water in your case, right? No, no, and in fact, I, I, I think when it comes to doing a systematic theology, you have to begin with Scripture. Yeah. It seems to me a systematic theology has to be, in that sense, it has to be based on what God has, God's Word. It's not something that you can copt on the basis of pure reason or on the basis of prior assumptions and arguments. It has to be something uh, scientific, if you like, that uh, is derived from hearing and receiving God's word. I think actually that the doctrine of eternal torment, in fact, does not stack up theologically because right. it leaves us ultimately with an eternal world where a large part of it is unreconciled to God. Uh-huh. There is this unreconciled and irreconcilable evil which uh, symbolizes rejection of God, uh-huh. whereas in, in conditional mortality, it seems to make perfect sense to me that if you reject God and will not have God, in the end, you cannot exist. Because in the end, existence depends on God. And so when the Bible says God will be all in all, as it says in First Corinthians uh, 15, that makes sense from a conditional standpoint, but it doesn't make sense, it seems to me, from any other standpoint. Mm-hmm. Very good. All right, so let's get into it. Matthew twenty five forty one says, Jesus speaking, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And so we have this phrase here, eternal fire. Some people may take that to mean that the fire lasts forever. How would you understand that? Matthew twenty five forty one, as well as verse 46, we see the same phrase there. Uh, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Right, right, yes. Uh, eternal fire doesn't need to mean that the fire goes on burning forever. And we can see that it doesn't need to mean that when we look at a similar use of the expression eternal fire in the book of Jude. In Jude verse 7, uh, we have the two notorious Old Testament cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know what happened to them. They were obliterated. Right. Uh, And in fact, the Bible stresses how quickly and suddenly they were obliterated. And yet Jude verse 7 says that they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So Jude says what happened to them is an example of eternal fire. So he's not saying that the fire goes that went on forever or that the people in the cities are being tormented forever. He must be saying something else. And what he's saying, I believe, is that the fire had eternal consequences and eternal significance. It is a last word, judgment from God. It is his last word on those cities. The fire that consumed them is an everlasting one in the sense that there's no going back. It has eternal significance, eternal in its effects. And so I think that the the phrase eternal fire in Matthew chapter 25 has the same import. And then the the expression eternal punishment 
it's important to see that the, the phrase doesn't say eternal punishing. Mm. Uh, this is not necessarily an everlasting activity of punishing or an everlasting process of punishing. But again, this is everlasting in its significance and its effect. And this is not, I don't believe, special pleading. This is not one-off language. There are other examples in the New Testament where eternal clearly means that. In Mark chapter 3, verse uh, 29, Jesus says that if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you're guilty of an eternal sin. Mm. It's not as if you go on doing that sinning yeah. that way forever mm -hmm. it's that th what you have done has eternal consequences it is eternal in its significance and effect and the, the jesus goes on to explain you will never be forgiven mm. so it's something that it's a last word so in the book of hebrews talks about eternal judgment in chapter six verse two well he doesn't mean that the judging goes on forever, but he means that the judgment has everlasting effect, eternal effect. He talks about eternal redemption. Jesus uh, securing for us an eternal redemption in Hebrews 9 verse 12. He stresses that the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was once for all. Once for it's all. not as if Jesus goes on and on and on dying for mm -hmm. us. But the redemption that he secured there on the cross has everlasting effect. It has everlasting significance, eternal significance. And Paul, in the same way in 2 Thessalonians 1, uses eternal destruction. You can't go on and on forever being destroyed. It really doesn't make sense. So I think when Jesus talks about eternal punishment, he means the same thing. The punishment, there will be no coming back from it. It does close the door, I believe, to universalism. Yeah. It closes the door to any idea that hell could be a purgatory which refines you and brings you back to ultimately to salvation. I think it closes the door on that. But it doesn't imply to me eternal torment. So I think that when you look at the way the, the expression is used elsewhere in the New Testament, I don't think you're shut up to the idea that we have here an assertion of eternal torment at all. Right, so we have multiple options for interpreting that word eternal. It could apply to the fire's duration or the fire's consequence, that it is yeah. an eternal it, it's consequence. Significance and, significance and consequence, yeah. Yeah, yeah just like People say, well, redemption. what about eternal life? Does that mean, does that not mean then that you live forever? Well, to be fair, you have to be a little bit more attuned to grammar, perhaps, to grasp the point that fire is not an action or a process. It's a state. It's mm -hmm. a thing. And therefore, eternal life can clearly mean that you live forever. Uh, it's not something which you do. It's not a performative verb. It's a, it's a state. It's a noun state. And so eternal life does mean, and it's clearly explained it to mean in the New Testament, that you that you are forever with the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas eternal judgment or eternal punishment, punishment is a noun made up from a performative verb. It's an action, and therefore it doesn't it doesn't imply an ongoing process forever. All right. Well, let's take a look at another one here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter nine. We encounter this phrase about the worm not dying and so on. It starts off in verse 43. With your, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And then it continues with verse 45. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And it, then it goes to your eye, right? You get thrown into hell again with your eye. <laughs> and then verse 48, yeah. where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So we had that really twice, the unquenchable fire of verse 43, and then repeated here more clearly in verse 48. What is this unquenchable fire, and what are we talking about here? 
Okay. Jesus is quoting virtually directly, virtually verbatim from the Old Testament. He's referring to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, where the prophet, it's in fact the last verse of the book of Isaiah, where the prophet says that they, the saved, those who are saved, will go out and they will look at the dead bodies of the people who have rebelled against God. Their worm shall not die, the fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Now, the important thing to note, first of all, is he's talking about dead bodies. So when he says that the worm doesn't not die, he doesn't mean that the worms go on tormenting people in a conscious living state. Mm -mm. The worm that he's using, that you're referring to, is the kind of worm that, in fact, corrupts dead bodies. It's got nothing to do with a tormenting conscience or any of those kinds of things. The fire is the fire that burns up dead bodies. So when he says that the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched, he's wanting to emphasize again that this is an irreversible judgment, that you can't stop the worm from completing its work. You can't stop the fire from completing its work. It's unquenchable in that sense. They don't die in that sense. They finish their work. It's not a tormenting fire. It's a consuming fire. And uh, again, remember that Isaiah is talking about dead bodies. After all, this word hell, which Jesus uses, what is it in the New Testament? It's that Greek word Gehenna. And Gehenna is, is a Greek equivalent of an Old Testament word. A couple of words, Gehinnom, the valley of Hinnom, or the valley of the sons of Hinnom. And what was that? That was a valley outside Jerusalem mm -hmm. where they tossed uh, the bodies, the corpses, of uh, outcasts and of enemies slain in battle, which is the very scene which Isaiah is depicting there. And therefore the valley became a symbol for what happens to the lost after the God's final judgment. It wasn't a place of torment, but a place where you threw bodies of enemies after they'd been uh, slain. So Jesus is picking up on that imagery from Isaiah. Uh, hell's got nothing to do with sinners suffering all kinds of torments, with demons tormenting them, or pitchforks, or some sort of <laughs> kingdom where Satan rules, or all these kinds of ideas at all. It's a place of shame, but it's a place of final and irreversible judgment, mm -hmm. final and irreversible death, destruction. Mm -hmm. Very good. That indeed is a different picture. We start to get the mythological vision in mind of worms that God has specially designed and imbued with eternal life so that they could continue torturing yeah. these other yeah. Yeah. damned people. I mean, it really just takes you so far outside of the original context of Isaiah yeah. 66, which is talking about yeah. dead bodies. It's not talking yeah. about the living dead or some sort of zombie fantasy that Hollywood would conjure up. You know, this is yeah. just not, that's just not the purview yeah. of the biblical prophecy no. that Jesus is pulling from here. So I really appreciate that. Well, sometimes, um, sometimes people get worried and but when you start talking about the Old Testament background, but you, you, frankly, there's hardly any chapter of the New Testament you can understand at all without some Old Testament background. It's not unusual to refer to an Old Testament background for New Testament usage to find out what is meant. And so that's what we're doing here. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. This is Revelation 14, 11. It says, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. And I, I'm going to pair that text with Revelation 20, verse 10 which says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Both of these scriptures have this phrase, tormented day and night forever and ever. 
it seems to be going out of its way to make the point that this is not temporary, but that it's a fire that lasts forever and that torments forever. And I, I think out of all the different scriptures, we're going to take a look at the rich man and Lazarus next, but out of all the different scriptures, I think Revelation 14, 11 and 20, verse 10 are the key ones that come to mind as the seeds of this idea that, you know, then eventually develops in the medieval period into the full-blown, you know, circles of hell and the, the different ways that people are tortured. So could you give us some remarks on, on these two? Well, yes, yeah, sure. The medieval period loved the book of Revelation because <laughs> you can, if you want to ignore biblical context and so on and just let your imagination run wild, you can almost uh, make it mean anything you like. And yet this is a book which is probably more imbued with the Old Testament than almost any other book in the New Testament. And if any, if there's any book in the New Testament where you have to constantly refer back to the under, Old Testament for understanding, it's this book. Uh, there's no doubt that the book of Revelation pushes judgment as far as it will go. And it's talking about the worst here. It's talking about in Revelation 14, it's talking about the worst, those who worship the beast. But even here, in my opinion, it falls short of eternal torment. Once again, you've got to look at the Old Testament background. And first of all, this expression fire and sulfur was picked up directly from the Old Testament story of Sodom and Gomorrah where it says in um, Genesis 19.24 that God rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire out of heaven. So once again, these cities are being referred to as a historical type of final judgment. That's often so in the Bible. Jesus did it as well. And remember what happened to them. They were obliterated. And the same with the smoke rising up. Revelation says the smoke Revelation 14 doesn't actually say their torment goes on forever. It says the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. In the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, the next day Abraham looks back and he sees the smoke going up like the smoke of a furnace. So even this expression comes from Sodom and Gomorrah. And the point is that this is a memorial, the smoke going up is a memorial to this horrendous judgment. The destruction was awesome, it was total, and it's irreversible. The smoke goes up forever. The effects are irreversible. The destruction is everlasting and it's significant in effect. You know, after all, Revelation 14.10 says these lost people are tormented in the presence of Christ and the angels. Uh, surely we're not supposed to imagine that Jesus is there forever watching these people being tormented. Is that really what he's doing forever? Yeah. He at Jesus and his angels? There, he'll be there for the judgment. The judgment will involve suffering, uh, but it'll be total and irreversible like that of Sodom and Gomorrah. We check a little bit further on for this. We look to Revelation 18, and you look at the fate of sinful Babylon, and there too you've got similar language. You've got fire, you've got torment, and you've got the smoke of her burning uh, going up, and yet it's all perfectly clear that it's all about final destruction. Revelation 18 verse 8 says, uh, about Babylon, her plagues will come in a single day and she will be burned with fire. Uh, that's a single day. It's not forever. And verse 10 says, it speaks of torment, but it also says in one hour, your judgment has come. And verse 17 says in one hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And verse 21 is pretty conclusive. Revelation 18, verse 21 says, Babylon will be found no more. So we're not talking about a, an eternal torment situation in the presence of God and the, Christ and the Lamb. We're talking about a process which ends in annihilation for Babylon. Mm -hmm. So again, comparison of texts in the same book. We're not going outside the book of Revelation to make that point. But we are looking at the Old Testament background of the language that's used. We come to Revelation 20, verse 10, and we come to 
the lake, and again, it's the lake of fire and sulfur. So we've still got that Sodom and Gomorrah thing. And now we're talking about the beast and the false prophet and the devil. And it says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Tormented day and night is the same language as you said in Revelation 14. Uh, but in Revelation 14, I've argued it didn't mean that they were tormented forever. It stresses that the judgment is ongoing while it lasts. Uh, the, the difference here in Revelation 20 verse 10 is it does say tormented forever and ever. It's actually the one verse in the Bible which actually uses that expression clearly. I'd make a couple of points here. I'd say, first of all, that the writer's talking not about the lost in general. He's talking about the devil and two symbolic entities, the beast and the false prophet. The, the entities in the book of Revelation that symbolize all this antagonism to and rebellion against God in its ultimate face, in its ultimate sense, the worst. And so he's wanting to, and he is, uh, stressing that this judgment is to the absolute limit. And he, he, he's doing that, and he's saying it in this way. He's maximizing the horror, but I think that he's speaking in a shorthand to maximize the horror. Tormented day and night forever and ever. Would you say that's a hyperbole? Uh, yeah, hyperbole, ellipsis, he, he, he leaves out the whole, he doesn't want to go into an elaboration there. He wants to stress the horror. He wants to stress the everlasting character of the significance of this uh, event. He wants to stress the everlasting effectiveness of this. And he expects you to bear in mind all that he said before. He expects you to come to this text with all that previous language about Babylon being found no more and so on. He expects you to have that in your head. He doesn't know that you're going to be coming to this text with all sorts of pagan ideas in your head. He just wants you to come with the rest of the book of Revelation in your head. And I think that he assumes that if you read it in that light, you will know that he's speaking in, as you are, in a kind of hyperbole and in a kind of shorthand. He also says in Revelation 20, that the lake of fire is the second death. Yeah. And he also says that death itself is thrown into the lake of fire. Now, what does he mean by that? Surely he's saying what he says in Revelation 21. Death will be no more. So throwing death into the lake of fire means putting an end to death. As he says later in Revelation 21, there's no more death. There's no more crying. It's all gone into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is not a place where these things continue forever. It's a place where they're put to an end. And so I think in the context, uh, this lake of fire is pretty clearly spelled out to mean annihilation, finish, yeah. judgment uh, that brings people to an end. When reading of a series of visions, it's important to distinguish between what John saw and what that communicates, what that means as far as propositional truth or future expectation. I, w I wonder what you think about the idea that in Revelation 20, verse 10, he saw in the vision this lake of fire and you know the beast and the false prophet were thrown in and you know in a vision in a dream you can perceive time differently than in real life you can get an understanding of something without actually experiencing it day and night forever and ever it could maybe communicate right. to john that this is the lake of fire that burns forever and ever that in the vision that's what he saw yeah. but then in chapter 21 verse 8 this verse you were just looking at we get the the truth of what the symbol means, of what the right. vision means. The truth is right. that it's the second death. Right. Um, but he did see this lake mm. of fire, and uh, it, it did symbolize this to to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder what you think about that 
way of well it's an interesting idea yeah. that the from the point of view of dream experience yeah he writes and yeah. then he tells you what it means yeah it's an interesting distinction you make there and uh i think it's worth considering and in the book of revelation after all is full of vision full of symbolism which doesn't mean that it's less true it just means that it's truth being conveyed in a different way yeah well i like it when the book explains what yeah. things mean because uh, <laughs> yeah when that doesn't happen i tell you mm. there there's all, all kinds of different mm. theories right yeah. but uh on the ones where it does explain it and it seems like that's what's happening there in uh chapter 21 verse 8 where it's it lists off, off all these kinds of sin and it says their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. To me, that yeah. seems like an interpretive move, like, yeah. oh, you know, just oh. in case you didn't get it, that lake of fire really just represents the second death. Uh, so I, I think that's helpful. Surely. And, and of course, then he goes on to talk about the tree of life in the New Jerusalem. So in his mind, it clearly is a correspondence to that first scene in Genesis 3, on the one hand, uh, you have the tree of life, which you can have access. But on the other hand, if you sin, you have death. Mm. And so that, that correspondence is still there, eternal life or death. That's, of course, magnified because this is now the second. This is the final. This is the ultimate, not the original, but this is the ultimate. Uh, and so it's magnified and it's, it still like, corresponds in some way to that first thing. It's, uh, it was interesting to me when I came across John Stott's opinions, everyone knows John Stott as the great spokesperson of, of evangelical Anglicanism, as he was, and I've got books by him on my shelves, and they're wonderful books. And he, he was uh, he was praised all over the world when he died, and quite rightly so. And, you know, in, in, in the book Essentials, which he co-wrote with David Edwards, it's a dialogue between John Stott the evangelical, and David Edwards is a more liberal cast of mind. And David Edwards challenged him among, about many, many things, and including this idea of hell. And uh, John Stott comes out quite clearly in that book in favor of annihilation. And on this particular text, uh, he comes to this text and he still says the most natural way to understand the reality behind the imagery is that ultimately all resistance to God will be destroyed. It was interesting to read that that was his conclusion. It's such a careful, such a faithful and thoughtful uh, and gifted Bible scholar and mm. spokesperson for yeah. evangelical theology. And that's what he decided. Yeah. That's what he read there. That's what he saw there. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the rich man and Lazarus, because this is one of these texts that really comes in a lot on the topic of hell. I don't think we have the time to really read the whole account and explain it in detail, but I'll just summarize it and then hit the uh, the key verse here and get your get your thoughts. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. All right, so you have a rich man, you have a poor man named Lazarus. Lazarus didn't have much going for him in life, but then when he died, their fates were reversed, and the the poor man Lazarus is at Abraham's side, and he's seems like having a good time. And the, the rich man, it says uh, in verse twenty three of Luke sixteen, in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, and so uh, there, then he asks Lazarus. There's a conversation between these two compartments, I guess, if you want to call it that, where the rich man asked Lazarus, can you put the end of your finger, this is verse 24, in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. And uh, Abraham basically says, no, nah, we're not going to do that. He's not, he's not going to help you out. You had your shot while you were alive. So this really fits nicely in with the typical view that in the afterlife, there are different realms, uh, typically considered as, as heaven and hell, where those who maybe had a tough life and, and uh, were poor, or poor in spirit at least, would be elevated in, into the good place. And then those who have had a good life, but they were cruel, would suffer in 
eternal conscious torment. So what would, what thoughts would you offer up on on this uh, rich man and Lazarus story that Jesus tells? Yeah, can I pick up first on the fact that uh, the rich man wants Abraham to send someone to warn his brothers? Yeah, yeah. They're still alive. I, I didn't so even mention is, that, but yeah, please. But yeah, warn his brothers. So his brothers are still alive. So this is not after the last judgment. So if we take this as a story which teaches us what happens after death, it is very much at odds with the rest of Scripture. It contradicts the rest of Scripture. The Scripture teaches re- repeatedly and consistently that judgment occurs at the end, at the resurrection, at the return of Christ, or the day of the Lord, all those things. Uh, not when you die. Not when there are people still living in the world. So if this were what happens, this were a literal depiction of what happened, it really contradicts the, the biblical teaching on judgment. So, so okay, so this is supposedly something that happens at death. Well, here we have a person in Hades suffering. It may surprise people to know that in the rest of the Bible, Hades is not a place of suffering at all. It's a place of death. It's the place where both the wicked and the righteous go. It's a death state for all people. It corresponds to the Old Testament word Sheol, and it's a place of silence. Uh, it's a place it's, it's often referred to in, in other terms like the pit, the grave, and so on. It's a place where, according to Acts chapter 2, Jesus went when he died and would be corrupting there if it were not for the resurrection. So this is not normally in the Bible a place of suffering. So we have to ask ourselves, what is going on here? We have to observe, secondly, I think very clearly, that it's a parable. Uh, Some people deny that, but it's really very obvious that it is. It begins, there was a rich man, and so on. Well, earlier in the same chapter, in the very same chapter, in the book of Luke chapter 16, there was a rich man. That's the parable of the unjust or the dishonest steward, right. as it's often called. Everyone agrees that that's a parable. This story begins exactly the same way. In the previous chapter, we have one of Jesus' most famous parables. It begins, there was a man. So this expression, there was a man, there was a rich man, introduces a parable. In any parable, you have to distinguish between the story and what it's teaching. The parable is not there to be read as a literal narration. It's there to be read for what it's teaching. Jesus told many parables, and he was very good at it, of course. He was the best. Right. But there were many, many teachers in his day used parables. It was a normal, common way of teaching. And in this particular case, Jesus is actually using an existing story which had been used by other people as well. Uh, It wasn't well known. It was known in various forms by Jewish teachers, by the Pharisees. And Jesus uses it specifically because he's talking to the Pharisees and he wants the Pharisees to take note. He's using one of their own stories and giving it a particular twist. Most scholars, in fact, recognize that this is the case. I'm not making this up. It's been well known, and you read Bible commentaries on Luke, and you'll find even scholars who aren't conditionalist at all still recognize Mm -hmm. that this parable is not a foundation for teaching about the afterlife. Uh, I read a book, The Reliability of the Gospels, by Craig Blomberg, who very much asserts the reliability of the Gospels, and he says this parable is often misinterpreted as if it were a depiction in detail, a realistic portrayal of life after death. And he says, uh, in fact, the picture of a rich man man in Sheol and Lazarus and Abraham's bosom is paralleled by popular Jewish and Egyptian folk tales. He says Mm -hmm. Jesus may have simply adopted well-known imagery and adapted it in a new and surprising way. So, it's not a parable where we, we look at for detail about the afterlife. We ask ourselves what Jesus is intending to do. And his purpose is to convict the Pharisees and maybe others of sin, particularly the sin of hoarding wealth for themselves and not caring about the poor. Mm-hmm. 
in the context, Luke chapter 16, 14 to 15, we're told uh, the Pharisees were lovers of money. They ridiculed them. So he said to them, you justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination to God. And that's exactly what the parable depicts, something which in our life, on our terms, looks one way, in God's judgment, is the reverse. In our judgment, the rich man's fine, uh, and in the culture of that day, he was approved, he was uh, assumed to be approved by God. The poor man is of no account. But in fact, in the judgment of God, it was the opposite. It was the poor man who was approved by God. And by, by bringing out that reversal in that context, he's, he's whacking the Pharisees in the eye with one of their own stories mm -hmm. and giving it a particular, uh, very memorable, very powerful twist. I mean, this story in terms of its power to convict you about your, your neglect of the poor is huge. Yes. And it has been fruitful in that way down the centuries and, and still is. It's a great parable of teaching. It, it also brings in the point to the Pharisees that it's Jesus and his teaching that is in line with Abraham and the law and the prophets and not the Pharisees. Because it talks about Abraham's bosom where, where the poor man is. It talks about uh, even if someone, if you don't listen to Moses, uh, nothing will convince you, not even someone rising from the dead. Yeah. So it, it, it teaches those things to the Pharisees by using one of their own stories. That's my, the way I understand it. Right. Uh, I think I read somewhere, perhaps it was in your book or somewhere else, th that Jesus is not here intending to give a topographical overview of the underworld or the intermediate state, but that he is actually trying to convict his hearers about their lack of generosity. Mm. And uh, I think that's a really strong point you make, that this is not about the afterlife. This is not even about the inner... Well, certainly not about the ultimate judgment, no. right? You, you started with that. So we know that it's talking about... If it's talking about anything, it's talking about the intermediate state. Yeah. What you're suggesting is that, no, it's actually not talking about that either. It's just a story that... Jesus and his hearers knew that was around in the culture, and Jesus is not endorsing the story, just like he's not endorsing you to rip off your boss in the previous no. parable. He's not endorsing the behavior or, or the, the view, but what he's doing is he's using it to teach his point, which is that you should be generous to those who are in need. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think that way of looking at it honors Scripture, because it's trying to interpret it within its context. I mean, Luke 15, we have three parables. Luke 16, we've got two. This is like the parable section. If this is not a parable, yeah. what's it doing in the middle of the parable yeah. section of Luke? Mm -hmm. it, you know, same thing with Matthew 13. It's the parable chapter of Matthew. You, you yeah. wouldn't have random wisdom sayings in there necessarily. You know, it's, it's a parable section or, or some other historical narrative. So, uh, you know, I think that is what you're trying to do. You're not trying to be evasive here. Uh, you're trying to get to the bottom of it. And uh, just knowing that, you know, this was, I, I, I would almost liken it to a movie. You know, if I start talking about Trinity and black leather and referring to the Trinity as, as a, a she, you get that I'm talking about the movie, The Matrix, not theology, right? right. Because right. You, you've heard of that movie or you've seen it. And uh, yeah. so Jesus is tapping into a cultural narrative here that they would they would pick up instantly, and he doesn't have to go on and say, "Now look, I don't endorse necessarily all this as a disclaimer." When he tells the story, they're all just like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Saint Peter went to the pearly gates, you know. Yeah. We we have a bunch of those jokes in America, at least, where Saint yeah. Saint Peter goes to the pearly gates, or, or somebody goes, somebody dies and goes to the pearly gates to see Saint Peter. And it's not like somebody really believes that's going to happen. Even if you believe no. in the heaven at death idea or the immortality of the soul, there's probably not going to be some like entrance exam by Peter, right? No, uh, but no, no. We, we tell that as a joke because it's just a setup. Mm, um, a and yeah. uh, it seems like this could be something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I appreciate your your thoughts on these these verses here. I think that's uh, where we're going to have to end it off today, just because of time. Mm. Uh, yeah. But any any final remarks or recommendations you'd like to make to listeners who are interested in delving deeper into this? I just wish that people who were conditionalists would would stand up and be counted. You know, the Christian tradition has suffered from the fact that even Martin Luther, for example, who <laughs> believed in soul sleep. You know, that, that in itself would have wiped out all the sale of indulgences and all this purgatory yes. rubbish right there. But he chose not to make an issue of it for the sake of not making even more of a rumpus than he was already making. You know, even John Stott, who knows that John Stott believed in conditional mortality? Uh, he says it, but who knows it? People, so many people who, who, who know him don't even know his condition. If we're going to make ground with, with understanding the Bible, we've got to stand up and be counted at some point. Uh, we might risk a, a bit of a fuss. We might ros- risk a bit of loss of status. Or we might risk mm-hmm. all sorts of things. But at some point, you know, the Reformation thing about going back to Scripture and deriving our, our gospel from Scripture it is t- always proven to be correct in the long Every time we, we are bogged down with tradition, we end up becoming less relevant. We end up becoming uh, more objectionable in the eyes of the world for one reason or other. And this t- eternal torment doctrine has rendered the gospel a laughing stock in the minds of so many people. And we really have to do something about it. We really have to go back to the Bible. We really have to, to, to purge ourselves of of tradition at this point and stand up and be counted. Yeah, I, I strongly agree. I think there are a great many professors in particular who hold a conditionalist view and who are who are educated on the matter and who keep their mouths shut mm. because they're they they're worried about tenure or yeah. they're worried about getting the job in the first place or they know that the institution has a statement of faith that mm. uh, they don't want to run afoul of. And yep. uh, we're talking about people's livelihoods. Uh, but, uh, you know, Jesus talked about the cost of discipleship in Matthew chapter yeah, 10. And, absolutely. you know, part of it is that there are legitimate times, like you said, to stand up and be counted and to let the chips fall where they may. And you may suffer. But Jesus says, if that happens, rejoice in that day, for so they treated the prophets who were before you. And, you know, are, are, are we going to be honest and try to really bring about this revolution in understanding, or are we just content to to sit on the fringes and on the sidelines and just hope that Chris Date will win win it all for all of us or something? <laughs> He's quite a champion, isn't he? Yeah. Or uh, or what's that bloke? Uh, Glenn Peoples is you know uh-huh. he'll he'll yeah. he'll you yeah. know lead the charge and you know just leave it to to Glenn and he'll take care of the rest. Yep. That's, That's not right. how these things work. You know, he needs no. support and he needs people to make inroads and yeah. uh, you know, uh, I think podcasts, YouTube videos, books, but uh yeah, ultimately he needs to get in the classroom so that those who are training the pastors yeah. will bring this out at least as an option, as a starting at point. Least, just it, it, uh, exactly, at least yeah, just it, throw it on the table that. Next to the at other least options, allow the dialogue to happen, you know, and don't shut it down. And yeah. Don't don't come up with statements of faith that exclude it. This yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, and I and I do believe. I, going back to this earlier point I was making, I do believe that there is a, a fear, uh, and, and it's based on a misunderstanding that, hey, if you if you soften your understanding of hell in any way whatsoever, you've gone liberal, and there goes the Bible. And uh, that is so not what's going on here. That's it's not the opposite. That's yeah. <laughs> How liberal is it to import all this this pagan idea? I mean, and, and, and import it along with the scriptures. I, I, I regard that as liberal. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else? Thank you very much for the opportunity to to the dialogue about it, and thank you for what you're doing in terms of putting it out there and enabling uh, discussion and enabling uh, uh, teaching to happen. And thank you for um, your openness to these things as well. It's, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a great ministry, and uh, I appreciate it very much. We need to use the technology. We need to use the social uh, media platforms. Yeah. I'm not so great on that. I'm of the generation which uh, 
before that all happened and I haven't really kept up at all, but I think uh, we conditionalists need to use those sorts of tools to yeah. to uh, keep the dialogue going. And uh, and, and as, the, as the dialogue happens, if it's true, people will see it, but they have to be given the opportunity and it has to be laid out fairly and it has to be laid out comprehensively and then people have the opportunity to see it. Yeah. And uh, that's what matters. Well, Warren, I, I really appreciate your work you are kind of a, a founding father in, in my in my, oh, in my, my estimation you know because oh, of your you. your book uh coming out when when it did and i know there were were others before you but just in my yeah. own theological oh. education your book was uh there when oh, i was going through training and so i uh it, this it's a real honor to meet you and to oh, well. be able to have these conversations i appreciate it's your very time kind of you to say so and thank you very much sean thank you for the whole process. It's been a real pleasure. Well, this brings this series to a close. What did you think? This is part three, and next week we're, we'll be moving on to an interview with Jeff Dibel about his book, Christ Before Creeds. But if you would like to leave a comment or question on this topic, the topic of hell and the fate of the lost, please come on to restitutio.org and find episode 406, Difficult Text for Annihilationism, and leave your remarks there. I did also, just by way of closing, want to read out a brief comment. This is a comment we received on YouTube about our class, Why Christianity, which ran for 16 weeks. And this is what the person said called Spread Truth. I've been soaking up these videos like a sponge. I wish I could have attended these classes in person. I'll be sharing the videos about the authority of the Bible and the six reasons to believe in God to my atheist family this weekend. I'm praying it will cause a stirring in their hearts. Thanks for posting. So if you haven't yet got a chance to listen to the Why Christianity class, it is available in your podcast feed for Restitutio just before this series started. So that's episodes... 388 to 403. Take a look at that if you haven't already. Also, just to let you know, we do have a separate podcast feed just for the classes. If you want to just run through the various classes that have occurred on Restitutio, including the Historical Jesus class, the Apologetics class, the Kingdom of God class, the 500, which is uh, church history covering the last 500 years, a theology class, a parenting class, a class on how we got the Bible, and then last of all, this one on why Christianity. So take a look at that if that appeals to you. Uh, Just search for Restitutio Classes in whatever podcast app you use, and you'll be able to find it that way. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can do that at restitutio.org. We'll see you next week, and remember, the truth has nothing to fear.